Now, Bruce, just look right into the camera lens right here and tell us your name, your age, and where you were born. My last name is Lee, Bruce Lee. I was born in San Francisco in 1940. Welcome to the official Warrior podcast from Max. I'm Lisa Ling, a journalist and a Warrior superfan. And I'm Hoon Lee. You may know me as the actor who plays Chow, the friend to everyone. And I'm also a writer on the series. Today, on this very special bonus episode of the Warrior podcast, we'll be celebrating the legendary Bruce Lee, whose writings inspired the entire series. 2023 marks 50 years since Bruce Lee's death on July 20th, 1973. We're bringing you something special to honor the man who started it all. You'll hear from Bruce Lee superfans, biographers, and his daughter, Shannon Lee. So sit back, enjoy, and be water. Lisa? Hoon? I hear you have a very cool figurine collection. You know this. I do, in fact, have a Bruce Lee action figure collection. Uh, unfortunately, it's not displayed right now, but uh, I've collected quite a few. Lisa Ling, tell me everything. <laughs> everything. About my Bruce Lee collection? No, about some unrelated topic. <laughs> well, no, I... I I, I don't know when I started collecting them. Um, I probably have about 20. And at one time, they were actually displayed in my apartment in New York. Like I had them on the walls. And for me as a young person, there were two Asian Americans who really impacted me, Bruce Lee and Connie Chung. And I would go on to pursue a career in broadcast journalism because Connie Chung sort of allowed me to know what was possible. Are you saying that you were just one decision away from becoming a world-famous <laughs> dominant martial artist? Because I believe it. Well, let's just say I, I, it. I have taken a few classes here and there. Well, challenge <laughs> accepted. What about you, Hoon? What, what is your connection to Bruce Lee? You know, I think it says something about him that my connection is probably quite common. My story, my the story of my connection to him, you just saw him on screen. He was such a a vivid, compelling figure. He was doing something and representing something that, you know, so many of us hadn't seen. Um, you know, I grew up in a fairly white community, so there weren't a lot of models around me um, to look at in general. But also, as I got to grow more familiar with him and his works and his philosophy, et cetera, I started to see him almost as a as a sort of mentor figure for how to live an artistic life. It was interesting to me that something physical and active and, you know, athletic would have so many thematics that were in common with what I was trying to do creatively, first as, you know, a visual artist or a musician, and then later on as an actor. And you start to see how all of those things speak to each other. Um, and he really, you know, puts the artist in that term, martial artist. Well, it is pretty striking that you and I are still talking about Bruce Lee 50 years after his death. That's true. And the impact that he's had, not only in our community, but in, in so many communities worldwide, it's pretty hard to overstate. Um, and the fact that all of his teachings now, they still feel incredibly relevant. All of the action that he's put forth now, it's still very dynamic and interesting. It's not something that feels incredibly dated. It's not something that you feel is, you know, out of place in the sort of pantheon of action cinema today. And for all the reasons you mentioned, Bruce Lee is still considered the most recognizable Asian American even today. Certainly one of the first successful Asian American actors in Hollywood. Globally, he is credited to have popularized Hong Kong martial arts films with his authentic portrayal of the art and of the sport. Yeah, and you see his influence everywhere. It's, you know, not only in the philosophy and in the athletics, you know, the nutrition, you know, he's sometimes considered the grandfather of modern MMA, but you also see his influence in music and in fashion and in television and obviously movies. But, but let's back up a bit to, to the man that existed before all the stardom. I want to ask you a little biography first. You were born in San Francisco, I understand. Right. 1940, November 27, Sagittarius. Ah. <laughs> a diplomat. And you moved to Hong Kong shortly after? Uh, yes, when I was three months old. Three months old, you moved to Hong Kong. This is an interview Bruce did with then freelance writer Alex Ben Block in the summer of 1972 while filming his third film, The Way of the Dragon. 
This is considered one of the last known surviving interviews he ever granted before his death. So it's really special that we have this. Yeah, just to hear his voice is so powerful. Bruce was the son of Li Hoi Chuen, a famous Cantonese opera star, and Grace Ho, a member of an affluent family in Hong Kong. I understand you were a child actor in Hong Kong. You know, I started acting when I was around six years old. What kind of things did you do? Well, mainly unimportant things. <laughs> <laughs> They're very important to me, for instance. So up to around when I was 18 years old, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I did something like, you know, uh, I mean, you know, a co-starring role. Other than that, it's kind of like, you know, not that important. Uh, Were you in things with your father? Well, no, not really. My father was in a Chinese opera. Uh-huh. A completely different thing, you know, and I never did like that, you know. Yeah. I rather like, you know, to watch the low ranger, you know. <laughs> Bruce himself said it. These roles that he played, they were small and unimportant, and, um, you know, whatever child star fame he had accumulated in Hong Kong, that was gone as soon as he returned to the States in 59. Uh, he stopped briefly in San Francisco, but he eventually headed off to Seattle to attend the University of Washington. I see. What was your major? Are you ready for it? Yes. Philosophy, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, did you ever have any other jobs besides being an actor? Uh, yes. I was uh, teaching martial arts. In the United States? Yes. Bruce ended up opening three schools, the first in Seattle in 1963, then one in Oakland the next year, and finally one in Los Angeles in 1967. Yeah, and he was such a revolutionary. You know, his ideas and philosophy around martial arts really helped democratize the art form and sport for anyone who wanted to improve themselves. Here's Bruce speaking to journalist and broadcaster Pierre Burton in 1971. I do not believe in styles anymore. I mean, I do not believe that there is such thing as like Chinese way of fighting or the, or the Japanese way of fighting or whatever way of fighting because unless human being have three arms and four legs, we will have a different form of fighting. Mm. But basically we have only two hands and two feet. So styles tends to uh, 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 not only separate men, you know, because they have their own doctrines and then the doctrine became the gospel truth, you know, that you cannot change, you know. And, but if you do not have styles, if you just say, well, here, here I am, you know, as, as a human being, how can I express myself totally and completely? Now, that way, you won't create a style because style is a crystallization, you know? I mean, that way, it's a process of continuing growth. W. Kamau Bell, a stand-up comic, television host, and self-proclaimed America's number one Bruce Lee expert, non-Asian division. And he is. <laughs> <laughs> shared his thoughts on the impact of Bruce's vision of martial arts. At the time that he started teaching martial arts, he refused to only teach it to people in his community. He was like, I want to teach martial arts to whoever wants to learn martial arts, which means I'm going to teach it to white people, black people. I'm going to teach it to Asians who are not Chinese. Like, I'm going to teach it to whoever wants to learn my specific style of martial art. And if you think about where and when Bruce was coming of age, this was revolutionary. We chatted with journalist, hip-hop critic, and historian Jeff Chang, who is writing a biography about Bruce Lee and what he meant to Asian Americans. This is what he had to say. When he moves up to... Seattle in the early September of 1959. He's still 18 years old and he's moving into the Central District. And this is uh, really where all the folks of color have been sent that, that because of segregation. And uh, so he, you know, he grows up next to, or he's coming of age uh, next to black folks, next to Japanese Americans who have been through the concentration camps, next to Filipinos who are the sons and daughters of cannery workers and migrant workers, right? Next to Latinos uh, and Native Americans. And that becomes his crew. Bruce would go on to teach stars like James Coburn and Steve McQueen. This was an interview with journalist Ted Thomas in 1971, who would later become a friend of Bruce's. Did you find them uh, tough people, the way they portrayed on the, on the screen? Well, first of all, James Coburn, definitely. It's not a fighter. Lover, yes. <laughs> I mean, he's really a super nice guy. Uh, I mean, not only that, he's a very peaceful man. He learned martial arts because 
find that it is a very, very, it is like a mirror to reflect himself. You know what I mean? I mean, like, I personally believe that all type of knowledge, I don't care what it is, ultimately means self-knowledge. And that's what he is after. Now, Steve, Steve is very uptight. Steve is very high strung, you know. Now, Steve, he can be a very good martial artist. But I hope that martial art would cool him down a little bit, maybe make him a little bit more mellower and be more peaceful, like Jim. <laughs> and there were four students who really made an impact on Bruce's life. Jeff Chang explains. The first is his first student, um, an African-American named Jesse Glover, who, you know, in his tweens was beaten uh, horribly by police for no good reason at all and spent his whole life looking for somebody to help teach him martial arts so he can defend himself. Um, and then the next person who, who really impacts him is Taki Kimura, who is 18 years older than him, but who is somebody who has gone through the concentration camps and had all of his, his hope taken away from him. And Bruce comes in like a whirlwind into his life, and he's um, suddenly drawn to him. And Bruce builds him back up, builds his esteem back up, and helps him become... Um, this sort of very giving, generous teacher. And the third person in Seattle who really kind of makes an impact in him, uh, actually there's four, let's get to that. The third person <laughs> is, is another woman named Amy Sambo, who's his first real girlfriend, who has also uh, come up through the camps, but has come up like full of fire and like, I'm going to go out and take on the world. And he is just really struck by her and inspired by her. And then the last, of course, is Linda, who becomes his wife, who, who is that person who, like Lee, has to make a choice within her family about, you know, how to, how to move ahead. And she's fallen in love head over heels with Bruce, and she fights her family in order to marry him. And I think that, you know, those four people teach him about the whole spectrum of the way that race is played out in the U.S. In 1964, Bruce introduced the world to his now famous one-inch punch at the International Karate Championships in Long Beach, California. Uh, I'm sure many of us have seen this footage. It's still pretty striking. The buzz about Bruce's demonstration made its way to Hollywood producer William Dozier, who asked Bruce to do a screen right. test. Give me a three-quarter on that side, and then give me right into the camera again. All right, now the camera will pull back, and uh, Bruce, first show me the... Movement in the classical Chinese theater. Classical Chinese well, theater. Well, you know what we talked about, how they walk, how they start to move. Well, in uh, Chinese opera, they have the warrior. It, it's a screen test scholar. that I think would change his life, right? It would eventually lead to Bruce being cast as sidekick Kato in the Green Hornet TV show. Now, the show was short-lived and lasted only for a season, but... The role of Cato really changed things for Bruce Lee. Here's Jeff Cheng again. You know, after the first couple of episodes, Bruce was the star. All the toys that were made were like focusing on Cato. But when that show ends, he is literally forced to go around, look for roles to play, and all the roles that they want him to play are, are unacceptable. <laughs> Throughout Hollywood history, but particularly during the 60s and 70s, a common theme that comes up is the emasculation of the Asian man. We're constantly getting cast as weak or meager servants and waiters or caricatures of ourselves. Here's Phil Yu, creator of the Angry Asian Man blog and co-host of They Call Us Bruce, a well-known podcast. Over the years, you know, as kind of political invective and the way we've kind of talked about Asians in our country as invaders and as um, something to be feared, you know, part of that kind of messaging was to play down sort of like the attractiveness of Asian men, of playing up the sexualization of Asian women. And so Hollywood representation of that kind of followed suit, you know, and so it's so hard to find depictions of Asian men as sexy, as attractive, as leading men. But are you saying that it was, it has up until recently been grounded in a fear of... Asian men or even of a looming 
Asia. Yeah. Well, how do you sort of undercut the threat is to depict us as weak, as unsexy, as people who are are meant to be sort of undercut and uh, put in their place. And these undercuts were things that Bruce Lee was definitely aware of and affected the roles that he wanted to play or the movies he was cast in. Here's Jeff Chang again. They're all, you know, chop chop sort of sidekick characters, uh, buck tooth, all these kinds of things. He hates it. So he he has to become a a choreographer, a fight choreographer um, for movies and those kinds of things. And he really relies on the good graces of his friends to be able to put him into things. But at some point, you know, they they reach a point where it's like, clearly he's not going to have any kinds of openings for him. And, you know, I've, I've talked to many of the women actors from that period. They're like, it was hard for us. It was mm-hmm. even harder for the men. You rarely hear that yeah. Yeah. in the world. Yeah, yeah that's what I've yeah. heard from the women at that time. Bruce fought against this. He landed a short role on the series Long Street. He talks about it in this interview with Pierre Burton. Tell me about the big break when you played in Long Street. Uh, I must tell the audience that uh, Bruce Lee had a bit part or a a supporting role in in, in the Long Street series. And this had an enormous effect on the audience. What was it? Well, you see, um, the title of that that particular episode of Long Street is called The Way of the Intercepting Fist. Now, I think the successful ingredient in it was because I was being Bruce Lee. Yourself. Myself, right. And did that part, just express myself, like I say, honestly express myself at that time. And I, because of that, I, I brought, you know, favorable mentioning in, like, New York Times, uh, which says, like, the Chinaman, uh, who incidentally came off... Uh, quite convincingly enough to earn himself a television series and so on and so on and so forth. Can you remember the lines by uh, Sterling Sullivan to the key lines? He's one of my students, you know. Was he too? Yes. (laughs) Everybody was my student. But you read, there were some lines that expressed your philosophy. I don't know if you remember them or not. I remember that. I said, this is what it is, okay? You're talking to Longstreet, played by James Francesca. I said, empty your mind. Be formless, shapeless like water. Now you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now water can flow or it can crash. Be water, my friend. And like water, Bruce adapted. Here's Shannon Lee, actress, businesswoman, executive producer of Warrior and the daughter of Bruce Lee. You know, the thing about my father is that after Green Hornet, he was really excited about the idea of bringing his message and showing an authentic portrayal of an Asian man in Hollywood. It was his goal. And because of that, he refused to take any roles that he felt were too stereotyped or shallow in any way, which meant that there were not very many roles. So he created his own ideas. It was around this time that Bruce began to conceive the idea that would become the treatment for the incredible show Warrior. And he talks about it in his interview with Pierre. There's a pretty good chance that you'll get a TV series in the States called The Warriors, in which you use, what, the martial arts uh, well, in a Western setting? Uh, that was the original idea. Now, yeah. Paramount, you know, I did Long yeah. Street for Paramount. And Paramount wants me to be in a television series. On the other hand, Warner Brother wants me to be in another one. But both of them, I think, they want me to be in a modernized type of a thing. And they think that the Western idea is out. Whereas see what you I use, want... You want to do the Western idea? I want, because you see, I mean, how else can you justify all these punching and kicking and violence... Yeah except in that period of the West. I mean, in, the, in nowadays, I mean, you don't go around on the street kicking people or punching people. Because if you do, yeah, that's it. I the mean, gun. I don't care how good you are, you know. But this is true also of the Chinese dramas, which are mainly costume dramas. They're all full of blood and gore over here. Oh, you mean here? Yeah. yeah. Well, unfor- unfortunately, you see, uh, uh, I hope 
that the picture I am in would either explain why the violence was done, whether right or wrong or whatnot. But unfortunately, <laughs> pictures, most of them here, are done mainly just for the sake of violence. Let me ask you, however, about the, the problems that you face as a Chinese hero in an American series. Have people come up in the industry and said, well, we don't know how the audience are going to take a non-American? Well, such question has been raised. In fact, it is, it is, it is being discussed. And that is why the warrior is probably is not going to be on. I see. You see, because uh, unfortunately, uh, such thing does exist in this world. You see, like, I don't know, certain part of the country, right? Where like, they think that business-wise, it's a risk. And I don't blame them, and I don't blame them. I mean, in the same way, it's like in Hong Kong, if a foreigner come and, be, and became a star, if I were the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, mon the man with the money, I probably would have my own worry of whether or not the acceptance would be there. But that's all right, because if you, if you honestly express yourself, it doesn't matter, see? Because are you, uh, how about the other side of the coin? Is it possible that you are, I mean, you're fairly hip, and fairly Americanized. Are you too Western uh, for Oriental audiences, you think? Uh, oh, man, like, <laughs> how? <laughs> I have been. Yeah. I have been criticized for that. You have, eh? Oh, I yes, definitely. So. Uh, well, let me say this. When I do the Chinese film, I'll try my best not to be as American as I, you know, have been adjusted to for the last 12 years in the States. and But when I go back to the States, it seems to be the other way around. You know You're too I mean? exotic, eh? Yeah, man. I mean, they're trying to get me to do too many things that are really for the sake of being exotic. You, 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 do you understand what I'm trying to oh, say? Oh, sure. You're so it's really, I mean, it's a new Bruce really straddled two worlds, never really fitting in. You know, in the U.S., he was considered too Asian, relegated to roles that were caricatures and stereotypes of Asia. Then again, in Hong Kong, some thought he was too Americanized, too Western for the Eastern sensibility. But in the end, the star power that Cato gave him allowed him the freedom and flexibility to make the films that he wanted to make in Hong Kong, where he starred in three Hong Kong martial arts films, The Big Boss, Fist of Fury, and The Way of the Dragon. And in each, you see his growth as an artist, an actor, and a fighter. He was working on the fourth feature, a collaboration between Hong Kong and Hollywood before his death in 1973. In an interview about Bruce Lee's legacy, Ted Thomas reflects on Bruce's success and what these movies may have meant to Asian and Asian American audiences during that time. What kind of a person was Bruce Lee? Well, he's extremely cocky, as you might expect, and um, as most actors are anyway, he, he would never have got where he was um, without having that tremendous self-confidence that um, seems to be a vital part of um, a successful acting career. Um, he wasn't... Uh, all that big-headed, or at least he didn't strike me uh, as being that way. But don't forget he was making films where he was trying to reassert the authority and the dignity of the Chinese race. I mean, he, he says one line in The Big Boss, they used to call China the sick man of Asia, well, China is no longer the sick man of Asia. And I think in Bruce's movies, it was the first time that where you saw a tough Chinese overcoming and humiliating big brutish Europeans, and that in itself was a a change. Um, I think whether he intended to or not, he gave back the Chinese a great deal of dignity in their lives, where they'd always been coming in obsequious, sort of grinning um, waiters and sort of um, uh, personal servants and things. He, For the first time, Bruce was a tough guy, Chinese, uh, without being a gangster, just a guy who, at some point in his life, said, that's enough, I'm not taking any more of it, and had risen up and given the Chinese um, a great deal of self-confidence. And following Bruce Lee, of course, then the Jackie Chans and the others came along, and they had a much easier path to take than Bruce had had. Here's Phil Yu again with Jeff Yang, critic, writer, and co-host of They Call Us Bruce. There's this idea of Asians creating opportunities for themselves, you know, and fighting back against oppression, you know. And I think that one thing that Bruce was always 
putting in his movies was this idea of the underdog fighting back against oppressors, you know, um, whether it's like gangsters kind of bullying a, a restaurant in Italy or um, Japanese occupiers in, 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 in Shanghai. This idea that we as Chinese, as Asians, we need to hold ourselves up, you know, and fight back against oppression, you know, and it's in, we might lose, but we got to fight back and we got to stand up. And so that's infused into the DNA of this show. How about you, Jeff? I want to not only say absolutely uh, to what Phil said, you know, ditto twice, right? But also add that there is something of like a, like a second generation Bruce presence in that so many of the people who are part of the creative team, uh, who are on screen for that matter, are clearly people who have been shaped by their experiences of Bruce, his movies, his legacy. Maybe one reason Bruce's legacy has lasted 50 years beyond his death and that his films have resonated with so many around the world is for the very simple fact that he, Bruce Lee, was, he was just being himself. There's an authenticity there. He saw martial arts as a form of self-expression and self-actualization. But he also used his art to comment on what it's like to be an underdog, uh, a striver, someone people don't expect to succeed or what it's like to be oppressed. Here's W. Kamau Bell again. The thing about his movies that I think that really sums him up, there's something about the fact that, like, when he wins the fight, he's usually not happy. Like, there's something about, the, like, you think about Bruce Lee and you think about these explosions of, like, of, like, of like the, the, the sort of, like, the wata or whatever. <laughs> but when Bruce is at the end of the movie... He's usually sad. <laughs> he's, usually, he's often getting arrested <laughs> like, or he's leaving town. So there's something about it that also makes it more epic and more human than just a guy who's like, I can beat everybody up in the sort of like, and nothing against the style of action right now where the, the hero sort of never gets hurt or the hero doesn't feel human emotion where Bruce Lee like beats everybody up. And at the end is like, man, I wish I hadn't had to do that. There's sort of an ethos of like, that's not the way I really wanted to handle this. I would have preferred we'd talk. <laughs> right, right, right. And that he was also standing up against something else. It wasn't mm -hmm. just that he was trying to defeat an opponent. He was standing up to all of these things, including forces of oppression. Yeah. Yeah, I think there was just a, a sense of like, I think he did a really good job too of like he understood his own personal power so that in most of the movies, he doesn't start out fighting from the beginning. There's a period of time in the movie where he's like, please don't make me do this. And so as a viewer, you're like, when's he going to do it? When's he going to, like, you're sort of like waiting for it to happen. Like, he's going to fight. He, and so it's not like the thing where he's like, he's been fighting for 90 minutes. He probably fights for an hour of the film. And for the first 30 minutes, he's like, I really don't want to do this. And it's always about, like, evil can't win. It's not about, like, I just need to fight. It's not Roadhouse. <laughs> like, it's not, yeah, like, yeah. We, it's not, we need to, we need to, we need to make this bar more inhabitable. It's not that. It's about, like, like, you know, and so for me, as I get older, my favorite film, the one I always return to, is the, is the second one known in America, I think, is Chinese Connection. I get the titles confused, but it's Fist, Fist of Fury. Fist of where Fury. He's, where he plays the student who returns and his, and his teacher's killed, and this Japanese school did it. And it's really about, like, it's a, it's a revenge film. But again, he gets arrested, and then in theory, you think he's probably killed at the end of it. So, and he's standing up against racism. And so as a little black kid who watches that, it's like, that's me. Like, that's, that's, like, I don't see him as, I don't see Bruce Lee as Chinese in that moment. I see him as black. And I think a lot of black people saw Bruce Lee as black or see the hero of a martial arts film as black, but specifically Bruce Lee, because Bruce Lee, not only did he have black people in his movies sometimes, but he's also taking a clear stand against oppression, which is black people in America. We know that fight. We're in that fight. And so I think there's a reason with it, like a lot of black folks really felt connected to Bruce Lee and felt like he was ours because we were like, we're standing up to oppression too. And man, if we could do those kind of kicks and punches, maybe we could stand up to oppression better. And so that's why I think the martial arts craze sort of swept through the black community as much as anywhere, maybe even more, because we literally needed to defend ourselves. I 
I just love this because this is what we experience as Asian Americans. There's this sense of solidarity in the fight against oppression. And we see it in the show, the need for Chinese Americans in San Francisco's Chinatown to rise up against the oppressors. It reminds me of something Jeff Yang mentioned, how Bruce Lee and his gaze and how Andrew Koji seems to be channeling it for Warrior. The stare signals a sort of resistance to hate and being othered as an Asian American, something I was experiencing as recently as the pandemic. I think, you know, you say it right there. It is a show that in its bones is about a certain kind of resilience and almost and defiance, right? Uh, that you can actually see in, in uh, Andrew Koji's stare, right? There's something about how Bruce epitomized the Asian gaze, a certain kind of gaze you don't see in any kind of cinematic image prior to his coming to America, to Hollywood. And uh, that's because most Asian characters before him, especially Asian male characters, either had to stare down, right, not raise their eyes up because they were in positions of humility, or stare up in, you know, supplication, don't kill me, or, you know, in, in positions of, of awe and respect to you know, the white hero for whom they were playing sidekick. And Bruce did not do that. Bruce always stared right in the eye with a little bit of a side glance, right? That is something which I think the entirety of the show does. It it represents a reevaluation of how we are seen, yes, but also how we see others, how we stare back at others. And so much of that period of the pandemic, when we were kind of reduced to gazes, like, just sitting in boxes on screen, right? This show, I, I think, was just so galvanizing at a time when we felt very much vulnerable, at a time when we felt like we were maybe at almost existential risk in this country uh, for because of the pandemic and because of the hostility that was being, being shown to Asian Americans. Yeah, that's that's really interesting about his gaze. I think there is something there to the power of simply returning a level stare, you know, and and the challenge that that implies and the, the confidence that it implies, and obviously you could back it up. Lisa, you had a chance to sit down with Shannon to talk a bit about Bruce's legacy. Could you share some of your takeaways from that conversation? Yeah, Shannon really reflected on how her father really wanted all of us to be our authentic selves. I mean, in my conversation with her, she mentioned how she herself had to learn that, especially with the legacy of being Bruce Lee's daughter weighing on her. Here's some of my conversation with Shannon. Your father really incorporated um, racism into his work, but spoke out on it and really... Um, tried hard to combat racism in the 60s and 70s. How do you think he would feel about what has been happening over the last couple of years with the astronomical increase in attacks against Asian people in America? I, I'm sure he would be incensed and heartbroken and angry to see how deeply rooted it is in our society and culture and how it's been exposed and sort of allowed. What do you think he would have done about it or tried to do about it? You know, he was not a shy person. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so he probably would not have been quiet about it. Yeah, I think he would have been very outspoken um, about it. I think he... I mean, who knows? I think he would have tried to take action because that's the kind of person he was. It's the person who took action. And I think one of the things that is he was able to do was to see the ways in which he was different and to see those as his gifts. And right now we're in a very polarized place where people see other people's differences and they fear them or they, you know, push them away. And really, those are the things, those differences about us make us able to cultivate a unique expression in the world. And, and they should be celebrated. Do you think that 
anyone is carrying on Bruce Lee's legacy in Hollywood right now? You know, here's the thing about my father's. His whole goal was self-actualization, right? And he wanted to cultivate who he was as a human being. And he did that beautifully and in such a way that it's really hard to follow in his footsteps or to emulate him by, by being like him. But I feel like so many people are like being their full artistic selves right now and in their own way being like a little bit of Bruce Lee and by being themselves so beautifully and being the true artists that they are. I mean, it certainly seems like there has been a a tide shift in the last few years. The remarkable thing about Bruce Lee is he was he was fighting these fights. <laughs> 50 years ago, more than 50 years ago. Yeah. And how alone he must have felt in fighting those fights. Yeah. I think that, you know, I've talked to my mother about this. I think he often felt frustrated and he could see it. Like he could really see the vision that he had for himself and for what he was able to do. And so therefore was able to keep driving for it, but nobody else could see the vision. And and I think that's a very lonely place to be. He died when you were only four years old, mm-hmm. but yet it's obvious that you have continued to learn from him. Oh, yes. What would you say are the greatest lessons that your father has taught you? Yeah. Um... I would say the the one that has helped me a lot and that I really need to remind myself of a lot is, you know, he talked about self-actualization and researching your own experience and really cultivating who you are. And that is something that I have needed to remind myself about, especially being Bruce Lee's daughter. Because I've been over the years, and now that I'm in my 50s, I'm finally getting better about it, but very hard on myself for not being just like him, right? For not being an amazing martial artist or as fit or as driven or as, you know, fill in the blank. And so having to remind myself that what he wants for me is to be me. And for me to know what that is so that I can be it. And it's been a big issue of identity for me. Like, where does Bruce Lee's daughter stop and Shannon Lee begin? And is there, are they, in, are they se- separated, you know, or are they inseparable? They're definitely inseparable in some way. And I think the other, I would say, is just that to look within that the answers are really within and that when we are right on the inside, then it's much easier to be right on the outside. Don't try to create something from the outside. To, it, it never works that way. You know, it, it still is amazing to me that Bruce Lee's legacy has just continued to carry on. I mean, Jeff Chang was talking about this survey recently where they asked thousands of Americans who who they think of when they think of famous Asian Americans. And I think most people or a lot of people said Jackie Chan, but Bruce Lee was <laughs> yeah, was right behind. Yeah. And again, 50 years after his passing. Um what do you think it is about your father that has allowed his legacy to persist in the way that it has? Yeah. I think he was very ahead of his time. And so when you're ahead of your time, like we're all just catching up to him, (laughs) right? True, true. And um, and so there's that aspect, but also, and I say this a lot, he had this foundation for himself of personal practice, of uh, personal growth, of Uh, philosophy and all of that, that he implemented in his life. And it was based in principles that are timeless, 
Taoist principles and, you know, principles just of human psychology and how our minds work. And the thing I always say is as hard as he exercised his body, he exercised his mind just as much. And when he had that strength of mind, the ability to quiet the mind, direct the mind to the creation of what he wanted in his life, um, that is the thing that I think we all look at and go, oh, he represents some kind of sense of what's possible. And it's very um, invigorating and exciting. I mean, when you watch him on screen, even today, even these movies, even these movies that were done, you know, years ago, decades ago at this point, his aura and energy and performance are still so exciting. And it's because he had this ability to use his energy and express it out in a way that is timeless. Much of Bruce Lee's legacy really highlights his martial arts skills and his philosophies and how his authentic self really forced people to see him as he is. So I want to leave you all with something I think about often, something Bruce said during his interview with Pierre Burton that I think encapsulates him and his legacy. You still think of yourself Chinese or do you ever think of yourself as North American? You, you, you know what I want to think of myself? as a human being, because, I mean, I don't want to sound like, you know, as Confucius say, but under the sky, under the heaven, man, there is but one family. It just so happened, man, that people are different. This is my favorite quote of his. It's something I come back to a lot. It's something I, I revisit on video a lot. And uh, one of the things that I love about it is that the idea of unity and the idea of a solidarity between all kinds of people is obviously present and leads the thought, but the the second half of the thought, the rejoinder to that thought, that people are different. It's you don't erase the differences; you you just acknowledge them. This is just a way that we are. It's just the facts of who we are, and it shouldn't preclude our ability to relate to each other as as one family under heaven. It's incredibly powerful, and I've I've, I've never grown tired of thinking about it. Yeah, just hearing his voice speak those words and thinking about how he did so more than 50 years ago and how over the last couple of years, I think so many of us during the pandemic felt so dehumanized. Um, just his, his, his words of wisdom that just continue to carry through after all these years and, and may in fact be um, as relevant as ever. Um, just so powerful. And that's it from us. Thanks to all of our guests who helped us celebrate the 50th anniversary of Bruce Lee's lasting legacy. A special thanks to Shannon Lee and the Bruce Lee Foundation for all of the amazing archival interviews and audio of Bruce. And we'd love to hear from all of you. How has Bruce Lee influenced your life? How are you like water? Share your stories on social media using hashtag BL50, that's BL50, and don't forget to tag at Bruce Lee. Next week, back to our regularly scheduled programming. We'll recap episode seven of Warrior and chat with the ever so talented Kieran Pugh, who plays Bill O'Hara. You won't want to miss it. He's a great guy, great guest. He's got an incredible beard. So we'll see you soon. Stream new episodes of Warrior Thursdays only on Max and listen to the podcast on Max and wherever you listen to podcasts. The official Warrior podcast is a Max podcast produced by the Mashup Americans. It is executive produced by Amy S. Choi and Rebecca Lehrer. Our producers are Sarah Pellegrini and Thomas Liu. Our development producer is Nicole Kelly. Our production manager is Shelby Sandlin. The show is mixed by Pedro Rafael Rosado.